Purdue, you have a choice on how you do that midterm. You can either do it as a take home, and that's been online since the beginning of class, or you can come to class a week from this Thursday. The only thing going on is the midterm, the in class version, which will be one of two kinds all multiple choice, and that'll be about 100 multiple choice questions. It'll look like a really long version of the quizzes you've been taking so far. The second is half multiple choice, half short answer. And that'll be about 50 multiple choice questions and about four short answers that you'll choose from about seven possible short answers. Okay, typically what people do, most people do the multiple choice, all multiple choice. Second choice is often the take home. But I think I told you, I tend to see what's called a bimodal distribution of the take home. Some people who've done it are precisely the kind of people who should. We've got the time to do it. We've got a good command of the theoretical concepts. We've got good writing skills. But the other group of people are those who probably aren't here in class, and they think, whoa, I can do it open book, cool. Well, and they tend to do very poorly. OK, so that's just a heads up. I think I've talked to you about that before. I'll do a much more in-depth discussion of this on Thursday. Because I'll do a review for the, uh, the midterm coming up. On Thursday, a large portion of the class will be devoted to that. I've talked to the TA. I need to arrange for classroom space. But he has agreed to do a out-of-class review sessions on this Friday of this week in the afternoon, Monday of next week in the afternoon, and then Wednesday of next week in the afternoon. So it'll be three of them. All in the afternoon, because that's what seemed to be the most interest to most students, afternoon sessions. And that's better for the schedule. Graduate student over the state. Okay, so any questions about any of that stuff coming up? You need to take the midterm seriously. You can't blow this one off, it'll blow you off. These little quizzes, you can blow one of them off because it doesn't even count. You can blow the second one off because it doesn't weight that much. But you can't afford to do that with the midterm. You've got to take it seriously. And I'm going to help you get ready for it. There shouldn't be any surprises on this, but so will the TA. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. so pretty much all the books I've been just like different. Yeah, it's all the stuff you've already covered. The kinds of questions, if you're taking the multiple choice, look very similar to the ones you did with the little quizzes. Uh, some of them will be the same question, but I'll change the wording a little bit. I'll change it so it's uh, what used to be false, was true, or, you know, I'll just change it so it's a different set of alternatives. You can that back into this way and see. There you go. <laughs> Okay, remember I still take it, looking at the names. Appreciate having them out there. So Michael, you can uh, do me a favor and some point pan around and get people with their names so I can see their names. So if you get a chance. All right, so no other questions, concerns, comments? All right, can somebody turn off the lights then? And I am going to open up the skylight a little bit. Does everybody have enough light to see their notes? Anybody have a problem with light? Okay. All right, let's review what we talked about last time because this stuff is not in the book, it's not in any of the readings. So this is real important for that you get this stuff down, the basics. Oh, first, uh, let, me do, uh, let me go back as far as I did go, which is a little bit of stuff on religion. Marx, religion is domination, religion is ideology, it is the opiate of the masses. But I said it was a little more complicated because Marx at least recognized that religion was functional before the Industrial Revolution. It was necessary because human suffering was inevitable and therefore religion gave a heart to a heartless condition. Part of that full quote. Then we talked about Weber arguing that religion gave rise to the Industrial Revolution. More specifically, Protestantism gave rise to capitalism. Three reasons for that. One, because Protestantism is a more individualistic religion. Two, because it stresses mass literacy so they can read the Bible. And three, and most importantly, a weird form of materialism that says, work hard, save your money, 
make a lot of money, but don't enjoy it. Put it right back into the business for the glory of God. Now, this is all boiling down. If you don't understand this stuff, you missed the lecture. I'm happy to go into more depth. But these are the main points you should be getting. All right. Any question on that basic religion stuff? Favorite marks. This is all reviewed from last quiz. It's going to be last lecture. Any more questions? Cool. All right. Then we looked at human origins. Human beings. The argument here is what, the reason for this <clears throat> we're trying to understand how human beings develop the ability to use technology. To find that out means going back to the biological record. It goes back to human evolution. The origin of our species, as most anthropologists agree, is on what continent? Africa. 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 Two to five million years ago, a common ancestor with what two other current animals, or two kinds of apes, are we closest to? Chimpanzees, Chimpanzees and? Bonobos. Bonobos. Do those species share a lot of human-like characteristics with us? Yes. Have chimps been observed in the wild using tools? Yes. Have they been observed engaging in warfare? Yes. Are they highly hierarchical? Domination of a single male? Yes. Bonobos, highly what? Most famous for being highly sexual, very similar to human beings, but also very empathetic. That is, feeling sorry for, feeling connected to members of their own species, even other species. They've been observed feeling sorry for little birdies. Is that also a very human-like trait? Yes. Human chimp. Bonobo DNA, almost identical, about 98.5% of our DNA is identical to a chimp. All right, common ancestor, <laughs> Africa, two to five million years ago. That splits off the chimps and bonobos go one way, our early ancestors go the other. Once that split has taken place, anything that follows on our line, any of those genus species are called hominins. Hominins. You may find it uh, in your notes, hominid. I just read the anthropologists have now changed it, so I'm bringing it up to date. It's now hominid, and I will expect you to know that word. It's the line of human evolution that splits off. Once the chimps and bonobos go one way, we're going another. Earliest human ancestors, what's the first noticeable human trait to occur amongst these very small chimp-like animals? Bipedalism. Two-legged movement. Why? See over the grass. They, one, they can see over the grass and they start getting taller. Taller means you can see over more of that tall grass. Bipedalism also has an advantage and it allows what? It's freeing up what? The hands. hands. The hands initially probably for provisioning. Provisioning. That is the trees don't disappear all at once. Gradually, home base is over there. They're picking fruits, nuts, and berries, carrying it back to their young. But eventually, the trees do disappear. And now, this chimp-like animal is going to make an adaptation to a new food source. What is it? Meat. They're going to begin to, well, initially, scavenge, which means they find the carcass of an animal an alpha predator has already killed, like a lion. Most of the meat is gone, but what remains is bones. They use stone tools to crack the bones and suck out the marrow. But that begins a very long line of human evolution. Yes, human beings are the most tool-using animal in the jungle, but chimps do some of it as well. But now, because of that ability to use those tools, they can begin to hunt. Not just scavenge, but hunt. And it's an advantage. If you have language to cooperate, you go this way, I'll go that way, that allows them with that better language ability to survive. And this is what evolution does. It's called an evolutionary advantage. 
have chimps and bonobos been known to use forms of verbal communication in the wild? Yes, they do. A chimpanzee will screech one way if a leopard is coming, which can climb a tree, versus a lion, which can't. Is that a primitive form of communication? Yes, it is. Is it a primitive form of language? Yes. Our ancestors, obviously, common ancestors with a chimp, had some form of verbal communication. Human beings, or the human ancestors, hominids, trying to survive in the plains of Africa are making an adaptation to the grazing animals. They're starting to hunt them. Language is an advantage of that. Also, tool use. Those that have a better language ability, survive. Those that are better able to use tools, which means a large brain, survive. And gradually, we get smarter and smarter, more and more sophisticated with language. And that's how we get to where we are today. Any questions about that very, very simplistic version of human evolution? That stuff I just covered will be on your midterm. And it's not in the book. It's very simplistic. I forget in this class, is there somebody who's taken physical anthropology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good thing you came in late. <coughs> so I don't have to apologize. You didn't hear it. Uh -uh. But at any rate, that's the kind of baby version of human evolution. No questions, comments on that? Yeah? Can you just go over the definition of hominid? Hominid is this group <coughs> of apes that split off from chimps and bonobos, those are our ancestors, our direct line. Hominid. Hominid. Once the chimps and bonobos are no longer part of our tree, now we are hominids. Australopithecines. All of our genus, Homo. There's a bunch of uh, subspecies of Homo. We just discovered a, a new one in South Africa. Just, well discovery for uh, a year or two ago, but just announced a couple weeks ago. Okay, again, any questions on this stuff? I think this stuff is fascinating, but I'm probably a few people in the room. But you will have to know it for this uh, the midterm coming up. <coughs> One more time, it's not in the book. You could probably get it by Googling human evolution, but you'll get a lot more than you bargained for if you do that. Because it's a lot more complicated than I just indicated. Okay, no questions? All right, so that then leads us to the Linskys. Remember, the Linskys are trying to explain the evolution of human culture. Not biological evolution, it's culture. But the key for the Linskys is the ability to use tools. And what kind of technology, what kinds of tools are most important for the Linskys? The production of what? Food. The term for that, did you remember, what is the term for that kind of tech, uh, technology? Subsistence. Subsistence technology. Subsistence technology is the production of food. Why is that important? Why does that give rise to civilization? According to the gives you time to focus on other things. It gives you the time to focus on other things. That's the key. If your tool for producing food is so primitive, that you have to spend all waking hours looking for food, is it possible to produce civilization? Even with a large brain? Mm. Huh? No. How come? Because you're looking for food. You need the extra time. Once this becomes more sophisticated, now you produce more food. 